So welcome to our first lecture for the digestion unit. Um, I'm not going to jump right into digestive system structures just yet. Um, I'm actually going to start with parasites. I want to start with parasites because I'm going to be talking about this throughout the unit. As we go through different structures, I'll talk about parasites that infect them. And the reason for that is parasites are generally underdiagnosed in the medical field. And I want to start familiarizing you with the different symptoms so that if you continue in the medical field, it might be something that you actually think about diagnosing in the future. And here's the reason I love parasites. This is a parasitic fungus called the cordyceps fungus. And it does some weird, strange things. First, it there are thousands of species of cordyceps fungus specific to a species of insect. And when those fungal spores get inside the insect, they take over its brain, causing it to do weird behaviors that would cause other insects to become infected. So like in an ant, it will tell it to crawl into the middle of the colony. And ants have developed some combating measures they actually recognize the behavior of this and then take those ants that seem infected as far away from the colony as possible. And then the cordyceps fungus bursts out and kind of eats the insect from the inside out. And this is why I like uh, parasites is because they do some very strange, weird things. Now, before I start talking about um, terminology with parasites. I want to go over the things that you will need to know about parasites. You need to know the name of the parasite. You need to know the life cycle of the parasite. You need to know the specific structures that I discuss with each parasite and the symptoms of infection for each parasite. Now, I may not cover those with all of the parasites, but anytime I bring up one of those things with a parasite, you need to know it. So let's talk about some parasitic terminology. The first things I'm gonna talk about are host titles. The first one being a primary host. This is also some kind of, sometimes called a definitive host. The primary host is the host where the parasite is reproducing or making offspring. This is oftentimes the host that the parasite is trying to get into. The transport host is the host that the parasite uses to get into the primary host. And this will make a little bit more sense when I go through a life cycle here in a minute. A transport host is also sometimes called a paratenic. So it, the parasite is often using these transport or paratenic hosts as kind of like an Uber or a taxi. They are using them as a way to get inside the primary or definitive hosts. So endo and ectoparasites. Since most of you probably grew up in the U.S., you are probably more familiar with ectoparasites. These are ticks and leeches. These are the things that live outside the body, hence the name ecto. Endoparasites, which you are probably less familiar with, live inside the body, and those are the ones that are going to be our focus during the digestive unit. Now, parasitic titles. These are titles that apply to the parasite itself. An obligate parasite refers to a parasite that is required to get into that host in order to reproduce. So if you have a primary host, then the parasite that infects it is an obligate parasite. It is obliged or required to get into that primary host. Facultative just means it can use that host. It's not going to die if it gets inside of it, but it can't reproduce in there. This is also sometimes called an accidental parasite. So let's talk a little bit about an example. Toxoplasma gondii. The reason I talk about Toxoplasma gondii as an example is because it's really infective. There could be as many as 60 million people in the United States that have Toxoplasma gondii. It's a really big issue for people who have HIV. It can affect them in very strange and awful ways. It can cause terrible birth defects or even the loss of a fetus in a pregnant woman, which is why they often tell women 
not to change cat litter when they become pregnant. And um, I'll talk about that a little bit when I go through its life cycle, which is over here. So let's start. I'm going to start down here. We have birds and mice. These are often prey animals for a cat. And in those, we have tissue cysts. These are kind of like, they're like hard little lumps inside of the muscle tissue. Uh, you can kind of think of them as like pimples or boils, but they're inside the muscle tissue. So it's not like you could express them. They're inside of the body. The cat eats one of these mice or one of these birds. So these are the transport hosts. The cat is the definitive host. This is where the Toxoplasma gondii, this little microscopic parasite, is going to be reproducing. And when it reproduces, it creates oocysts, which were are kind of like eggs. Uh, the oocysts are kind of like eggs and they're passed in the feces. And the mice and the birds kind of pick them up. Maybe they rub against some um, fecal matter or um, maybe the fecal matter decomposes and the oocysts are left on the grass, whatever. They then consume those oocysts, usually by breathing, and um, they are become infected. Usually how people get it is by either eating organisms that have become accidentally infected. So this means that they just breathed in some fecal oocysts and they got some tissue cysts. And then we didn't cook the meat high enough and we became infected as humans. Um, the other way is cat litter or if the oocysts are on food and we don't rinse it off. Um, and then we can become infected. The other way is blood transfusions. So there are quite a few ways that humans can get this. And usually our uh, immune system can keep this um, little parasite at bay, but sometimes it doesn't. And I wanted to, I have a little video, oop, went too far, hold on. I have a little video about what happens there. Hi. My name is Dr. Bakugondi, and I'm a parasite. Step into my primary host. I have a skill that I want to share with you. I can control minds. For example, I can make rats normal fear of cats disappear. Normally they avoid open spaces, and I don't like the smell of cats. I can tweak their brains so that the fear of open spaces disappear. So in case you didn't hear, what he said was rats and mice have a fear of open spaces. This is why they run along walls, um, because cats are generally in open spaces and they're generally not running along walls. And Toxoplasma gondii will make rats and mice unafraid of open spaces. So they'll just start running across the open floor. And this can cause them to be eaten by a cat. So this is actually a form of mind control, like we saw with the cordyceps fungus. Just love the cat's milk. This makes it easier for me to get inside a cat. But I want to tell you what I do to humans when I get inside of them. It's not pretty, I can tell you. I cause abortions in pregnant women and I can infect the kids as well. And if I do that, the consequence can... So he said that uh, Toxoplasma gondii can cause abortions, but it's actually more accurate to call them miscarriages. So the fetus can be um, so infected during, with Toxoplasma gondii that you can lose the pregnancy. Um, and he's going to talk about some other things here. For example, or deafness and mental retardation. I can cause delusions and hallucinations to humans and even schizophrenia. But the most disturbing part to some people is that I can change their personalities. I can make men become less willing to submit the moral standards of the community, less worried about being punished or breaking society's rules. So, I'm running out of time, but I wanted to talk about the fact that it changes people's behavior, which is a really serious um, disease.
And that's where we'll end.